I'm really happy to be here with you all today. 230 of you, and I know we also are on CTN, so um, this is a this is a great turnout. We're happy to be here today. Um, I want to start uh, after welcoming you all by thanking uh, Lorna Thomas for Carson and the whole OEC team uh, for putting this together. And when I say the whole OEC team, I also mean our partners who support us and work with us in this work, who you're going to hear from today. Um, we are hoping to highlight supports that are out there for you as an early childhood educator, talk about some best practices, um, because even as recently as yesterday, I heard from providers who were struggling to support children that needed extra supports, and they didn't know sort of where to turn. And I could, as commissioner, direct them to services, but we want to make our services widely known. Um, we want to make sure we present you with options that will keep the children and families at the center doing our best. Um, to accommodate families and children. Um, every child is so different. And those of us who've worked with children know that. Um, and some come with particular challenges. At OEC, we are working to enhance our communication about these supports that are available. And this topic is of high interest. Obviously, I now see 244 participants. So we want to get to it. We're lucky to have folks from the State Department of Ed our keynote speaker, Mel Hill, who will help us stay grounded in family and family needs. Um, we also have um, Dr. Michelle Levy here, who's going to talk around OEC statement on expulsion and, and suspension kind of discipline and, and where we are there. Um, and then uh, Lorna will present. And then really can't, I'm really looking forward to a panel discussion from many organizations and individuals who are serving families and programs um, when children need extra supports. And Lorna is gonna facilitate that. And then super excited to have a message from Dr. Walter Gilliam, now who many of you know, he left us in Connecticut to go to Nebraska um, where he's at the Buffett Institute, but he's still doing great work there. So. Um, to get things started, I'm going to turn it over to Kim Traverso from the State Department of Education. Um, she is from the Office of Student Supports and Organizational Effectiveness. Kim? Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm not sure if you can all hear me. I can hear you. Okay, perfect. I apologize. This morning, for some reason, I cannot get into Zoom. So I am uh, calling from my phone. So I, first of all, I just want to apologize for that. Uh, we'll probably try to figure this out um, as far as technical assistance will be on its way. But no let me problem. get started no by problem. saying thank you, Commissioner Bai. I really do appreciate this partnership. Um, and good, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for being here. And I'm honored to be part of such an esteemed panel sponsored by the Office of Early Childhood. Today, I am representing the Connecticut State Department of Education. I want to acknowledge how critical this work is regarding positive approaches to challenging behaviors. Our goal is to have a paradigm shift to, to compassionate learning spaces and using alternative means rather than suspensions and expulsions to address behavior. And we can do a lot of this work through advocacy, collaboration, our leadership, and of course, systemic change. So why is this so important? Did you actually know that exclusionary school discipline practices have a disproportionate adverse effect on students with disabilities, students of color, and low-income students? Students who have been expelled or suspended are as much as 10 times, 10 times more likely to drop out of school, um, experience academic failure, grade retention, and actually negative beliefs about school. So there's a wealth of uh, research that is out there demonstrating that this broad discipline category called school policy violation, which includes defiance, disrespect, disruption, all these are very subjective and cause grave harm to our kids. So it is really imperative that this work starts in early childhood so that the trajectory for our students is, of course, going to be better engagement, improved academic Recording in progress. 
and pro-social development. We are working together with the Office of Early Childhood to build a comprehensive, intentional system of support, not only for our students, but training our staff as well, and being inclusive with our families so our kids, at the end of the day, will flourish and thrive. Thank you. Kim, thank you so much. Uh, our partnership with the State Department of Education is so important. And I just really love how you leaned in on the word compassionate. And, and I think, you know, folks that work in early childhood are compassionate caregivers. And sometimes they feel like they're with certain children um, and behaviors they're, they're in over their head. And, and sometimes they get supports from the public schools and sometimes from birth to three and sometimes from some of the programs you'll hear about today. But uh, starting when they're very young, there are some comprehensive approaches that start with compassion and seeing every child um, that that can make a big difference. So um, really appreciate, really appreciate your partnership. Um, next, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Melvette Hill. So Melvette is an incredible parent leader in Connecticut. Melvette, I can't think of a better keynote speaker because I think when it comes to these issues, we have to start from the perspective of the child and the family and understand that you know there's a system there at work and we don't just look at the child separate from the family. And we wanna give parents tools that they need to advocate for their child and for the best setting for their child. And you train parents across the state in just how to do this. So Melvette, um, I've known you probably coming on, on 20 years as an advocate up at the Capitol for families. You've worked in the government and nonprofit sectors, um, and I've I've really appreciated you um, at PLTI classes when I'm meeting with parents and helping them really push me as a lawmaker at the time, and now as commissioner for what are we going to do about some of these challenges uh, that that families face. So um, right now you're at the Commission on Women, Children, Seniors, Equity, and Opportunity. And um, I think your message is super important today. And uh, you're sharing the stage with Dr. Gilliam. That's a good day and so many wonderful partners. So um, I can't wait to just listen. So um, thank you. And I'd ask who's ever doing the Zoom to spotlight Melvette so we can, we can see her as a speaker um, in full, full view. Um, thanks, Melvette. Thank you so much. I'm so excited uh, to be here today. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And I'm so honored to have this opportunity to share with all of you today. Thank you so much, Commissioner Bai and Lorna uh, Thomas Parkinson and the rest of the team at the Office of Early Childhood for making it possible for me to be here with you, um, not just bringing these opening remarks, but also uh, being able to share about my parent leadership journey. Um, I'm also grateful to address and to share in this virtual space with parents and caregivers, community leaders, and the esteemed early childhood educators in the audience today. Uh, so as uh, Commissioner Bai mentioned, my name is uh, Melvette Hill, and I'm a parent leader. Um, and what does it mean to be a parent leader? For me, quite simply, it means leading for my children, my family, making decisions uh, for their current well-being and future. Uh, it means advocating for what they need Recording to play, progress, play, progress, play, play, and have joy. It also means leading on behalf of all children in here. I'm hearing an echo. Is anyone else hearing an echo? Can you hold on one sec, Melvet? I just think we need to mute that participant. Thank, thank you so much. Sorry about that, Melvet. Back up just about two sentences. All right. Uh, so what does it mean to be a parent leader? For me, it quite it means just leading for my family, uh, making decisions for their well-being and their future, advocating uh, for what they need to thrive, live, and play, and have joy. Um, it also means leading on behalf of all children and families, ensuring that they have equal access and opportunity. Um, in PLTI, the Parent Leadership Training Institute, we define parent leadership as the capacity for parents to interact within society with purpose and positive outcomes for children. And so in 2004, I graduated from the Parent Leadership Training Institute. Uh, PLTI is a, a family civics initiative of the state of Connecticut. It's housed at the Commission on Women, Ch Children, Seniors, Equity, and Opportunity. 
Um, and it is a personal leadership and civics curriculum for parents who want to understand how to engage in change making in a productive way. And so PLTI has been part of my leadership journey. And I'm so fortunate that today I lead the work of the Parent Leadership Training Institute here in Connecticut. And I also partner with the National Parent Leadership Institute to implement PLTI across uh, the country. We are currently in 70 communities across our nation. Um, so I became a parent when I was 19 years old. And today I have four bright, loving, productive adult children who are the joy of my life. I also have two grandsons who are not only the joys of my life, but have completely stolen my heart. I'll come back to them in a few minutes. Uh, we're going to put their picture on the screen uh, shortly. But as a mother of four children, I was advocating for each and every one of them right from the start. From New York to Connecticut, I was constantly and consistently and with full commitment advocating for services and the best options and opportunities that were available to them as students. And whether it was through special education supports and services or advanced placement opportunities, I was always researching, testing, probing, and insisting on their behalf. It was through my interactions with the Birth of Three system here in Connecticut and Head Start where my first leadership opportunities in Connecticut were presented. First, my twins uh, qualified for language services through Birth to Three, and I had the most fantastic, skilled, and loving education consultant who worked with my family. Her name is Paula Veluzzo, and yes, I remember her name. Why do I remember her name? Because she became part of our village. And from birth to three, my twins went on to Danbury Head Start at Mill Ridge and also the Danbury Public Schools preschool program. One of my twins needed some additional care and support. And so he went to two programs. And it was at Head Start, I was invited to become part of the policy council and became vice chair in the next year I was chair. And about five years later, my fourth child qualified for services from birth to three different child, different needs, different challenges in development. And I requested Paula be our person again, because she already knew uh, she was part of our village. She knew our family. She knew our dynamics. She knew our needs. And so Paula joined us again, right? I advocated for what we needed. And um, our sessions began with our baby girl. And over the course of two years or so, Paula was with us. Um, and she started introducing uh, this Parent Leadership Training Institute to me. And she gave me my first PLTI brochure and application. And of course, the first time I was like, sure, I'll take a look. But I knew I didn't have the time or mental or physical capacity to take on another thing. I have four children, all in different stages of school. And on a good day, I was just happy to get a shower and a good night's sleep. But Paula, this early childhood educator, was persistent, and she believed in me, and she had a feeling that this could be something special for me. She never said to me, you need to do this or you should do this. It was always an invitation to explore something new and different, and she knew the world needed me, something that I didn't understand at the time you know, being entrenched as being someone's mother and being a wife. I wasn't in touch with the other pieces of myself. And perhaps I have forgotten the investment of love and resources and opportunities that were given to me by my own parents. There were so many seeds of greatness that had been planted, but at that time the warding was sparse and the sunlight was dim. But Paula was trying to water my garden by sharing that opportunity with me. And so finally, after Paula connected with me, um, connected me with another parent leader who I am still friends with to this day, uh, she shared about uh, the PLTI journey that she had gone on, I decided to apply for the next cohort. And 19 years later, I am still here, part of that PLTI alumni community, leading with others and at the helm, leading this initiative in the state. It was the action of that one early childhood educator simply offering me something, exposing me to an opportunity, persistently and lovingly challenging me to step out of my now into something new, something that would ultimately align me with what I had been put on this earth to do. And so early childhood educators and workers have a place, a special place in my heart. That first example was Paula. My second example, um, because of it's because of my own experience in early care. So I'm going to ask them to put up the picture of that three-year-old, that cute little girl, um, who is me. Uh, and if you can see on your screen, this is me at the age of three. 
And um, in the early 1970s in my community, there wasn't preschool in New York City, not in my community. My father worked, my mother worked, she was a registered nurse and, um, and she worked at a hospital, a very busy hospital. Um, and she went back to work as soon as she could. And there was a family friend and neighbor, Miss Mickey, who cared for me until I became too much for her. You know, she cared for other children as well, but, and this was a home-based daycare. So let's do a shout out for our family child care providers. Those of you who are running home-based daycares, but I was rambunctious. I talked all day, even with my own language delay, I was still very vocal. Um, and in her words, what my mother told me was that she said, you were a handful and she can no longer provide the type of care that I needed. Um, she had many children underfoot and found it difficult to keep up with me and to continue me in her care uh, with all these other children and the various pets that she had. So my parents had to find something else, a place where that little three-year-old girl could learn and grow and develop and be excited and stimulated each day. Uh, my older sister at the time was at a local Catholic school, St. Thomas Community School, and they didn't have a preschool program. They only had kindergarten. So guess what? My parents pretty much begged the principal to take me. And there I was in kindergarten for two years because they wouldn't send a four-year-old to first grade. And we know socially, emotionally, developmentally, that probably wasn't going to be a good idea. I mean, I was a four-year-old with a, a January birthday. Um, and so that's where my educational journey began at St. Thomas Community School in Harlem, New York. And I still to this day remember my kindergarten teacher. Her name is Miss Drexel. Um, and so I'm going to say her name out loud today to honor her. For all of you early educators out there, I just want you to know that your students remember you. They might not remember your name when they get to be in their 50s like I am, but they will remember you. They will remember your care, the love, the warmth, and your words. I remember Miss Trexel. She was a smaller, uh, shorter adult. I remember she was much shorter than my mom and dad. Uh, she was a white woman from South Africa working in Harlem um, in a black community. And she had come to the States to teach because she loved teaching. I remember Ms. Trexel wanting me uh, to go with her to South Africa during the summer because as she explained to my parents, who's going to take care of her uh, in the summer when school is out? I'll take her with me. Uh, Ms. Trexel and I probably had a very unusual relationship. I consider it unusual as a parent and as a grandparent today because I can't even imagine if one of my children's teachers or one of my grandson's caregivers would say to me, uh, we want to take him or her outside of the country uh, to take care of them for the summer. But Ms. Trexel was a very special person and we had a very special relationship. That's reason number two I esteem early educators so highly. And that's where my preschool journey began. But when I married, I moved to Danbury, Connecticut, and my husband and I raised our family here. And now I have these four adult children and two grandsons. Let's put my grandsons on the screen. Let's see their picture. They're awfully cute. They are reason number three that I esteem early educators. My two grandsons are in um, great programs. Uh, Josiah, the big brother there who just turned four is in the Danbury Public School Systems uh, School Readiness Program. And Ellis, the baby brother who will be two in November is in a home-based childcare setting, Little Hands Daycare. I've seen firsthand what early care and education can do. And I'm gonna tell you, uh, they are very challenging, the two of them. They both are uh, something spectacular because I'm their, their Mimi as they call me. But, you know, I do say lots of prayers uh, for their, their um, early educator providers because they too are a handful. Um, and so it's important, all of this and me sharing my own personal experiences, why it's important for parents and early care providers to work together, to share their voices and to create change together. And so I'm excited uh, to do this work in policy as well um, as in parent leadership and family engagement because I feel like I'm helping build a future for them in this place. And my hope is that they will be able to live and thrive and grow in Connecticut and that they will have an education that serves them well and serves them to the extent that they're able to engage in our society in productive ways, whatever their career choices may be. And so my grandsons, Josiah Hill and Ellis Hill and their parents um, live and uh, work in Danbury, uh, Connecticut. My son is a school social worker in an elementary school in Danbury. And my daughter in love is which I, what I call her. She teaches English language arts at a middle school. And she also has her TESOL certification. And so these are my people. This is my family. This is part of my story. This is a story of leadership. And this story, this is the story of how I began and how I came to be who I am today. And this is my experience with my family. And so within early childhood, there are many stories like mine. 
And uh, my early childhood story and education uh, has many branches on the tree. One of those branches, I have to admit, um, even though I'm showing up in this space as a parent and with the voice of a parent, I also was an early childhood educator. I was director of our early learning center in, in New Milford, Connecticut for a short time. And so I do understand the plight and the challenges and I understand the commitment. I understand the investment that it takes to be a person who's in the classroom with little ones, as well as a person who's running a learning center. And that's the fourth reason I esteem early educators. I'm also a person who works on policy uh, in, in Connecticut and federally, and I wear many hats. I know that this work of change and embracing change and looking at new policies and practices that benefits families and providers, I know that it can't happen in silos, but I know it takes a village of voices to raise a child here in Connecticut and to create the change that we wanna see. And so I leave you with this, I ask you to consider your intentions today. Know that we have to be in this together, parents, caregivers, working together with providers, agency leaders, and policymakers. I want everyone watching today to understand I speak truth with urgency that the voice of parents, their lived experience is not only needed, but required if we're going to move forward with equitable policy, practice, and strategies that serves all within the system. And as we embark today to dive deep into a conversation while learning and hearing from a panel that's going to be exploring these policies and practices surrounding suspensions and expulsions of pre preschoolers, I shared this story of myself and my family as a backdrop to hold before you as we consider who these children are. They are me. They are my children. They are my grandsons. And if you accept your role in this village, they are your children too. And I'm hopeful today, um, so let's be hopeful together of where we can go. Think of yourself, think of your own leadership, think of your hopes, your dreams, your vision for a hopeful future, and think about what is the hope that you have for our village? What is the hope for our 169 cities and communities? Uh, the people and providers in those communities are the assets. They are the supports that come together that can surround our children, embrace them and lift them up. And, and we too can raise these little people together. And at the center of all of this, right, we have um, different gifts and talents uh, that people bring to community. We have the diaspora of many, from many cultures, backgrounds, countries and faith. And in the center of it all, we have the underserved who are often seen as undeserving. And we have rich diversity of culture and those who are rich in resources those who are rich of hopes and dreams. And within the village, there are voices, so many voices, some louder than others, but in most villages, what is most important are the children. And so I wonder if you've heard of this, uh, of this greeting that happens in many countries, maybe not ours so often, but in many countries, many cities and villages and small nooks and crannies on the earth, people ask first, how are the children when they greet each other? There's no, how are you? What did you do today? It's always about the children. It's about the care of the children. Why? Because the care of the children, the health of the children is an indication of the health of a society. It's the health of a village. And so the children are doing well. If they're doing well, then we're all doing well. And so today I have come to understand that not only does it take a village, but it takes a village of voices to raise a child. It takes a village of voices to bring economic prosperity to families in Connecticut communities. And haven't we learned yet that thriving families drive economies? It's not just about jobs and education and workforce development, but it's also about ensuring that young children in Connecticut have the supports they need not only to to survive, but to thrive and to dream and to pursue their potential. And it takes a village of voices, your voice, my voice, our voices together to say and declare that every child has the right to their best basic needs being met, options for restorative practices and grace, but also the right to dream and to aspire to greatness and for others to see that the potential of these children and families are not tied to their current condition which in many cases can be very disheartening. We can agree together, can we, you and I, to see beyond the now and envision a future for them that we are all invested in. And I also say it takes a village to bring equity and inequitable systems that need to be restructured and reimagined for both children, families, and caregivers and early childhood educators. Affordable, sustainable, and growing. And it takes a village to lift up voice, um, and listen to and acknowledge the voices of these educators in our spaces today, also who have their own families and their own hopes and their own dreams. 
it is my voice. It is the voice of other parents and grandparents and those who have a stake, a stock, or even a Bitcoin in this self-defined success of Connecticut families and the early care and education system here. And so I want you to know today we see you and it takes a village of voices to say that this generation right now of parents and caregivers and educators, decision makers and policy makers must take care of themselves, making sure to uh, practice self-care at home, at work, and in community, and moving from self-care to community care. Because with community care, we can accomplish so much more as we look at the mental health and well-being of our children. We are the village of voices, we parents and grandparents and lovers and carers of children, and our village voices matter. So let us understand that as we have experienced the welcoming of voices of parents at many tables now as advisors and experts with lived experience who are engaged in educational systems. We see these tables are being opened up and we see that there are even chairs being pulled up to advisory tables. The Office of Early Childhood has the Parent Ambassadors Program. It also has the Parent Cabinet. The Department of Children and Families is welcoming youth and young adults at tables as well. And our two generational initiative has an advisory board that is made up of 25% parents. And it takes a village of voices to make space for even the quietest voice in the room and the shyest voice in the block. It takes a village to raise healthy ch children. And we have to consider how we're defining healthy these days when so many of our children have experienced trauma that leads to challenging behaviors. And so we have to understand that when we look at healthy children and how children are showing up in educational spaces every day, that they are bringing with them, aside from their beautiful faces and their intention to have joy and happiness, sometimes life is playing out very differently for them. And so we have to understand what it really means to bring these children into our care and to, and to love on them. And so we have to encourage policy and practices that are positive, enriching and responsive to children, that there is space for the social emotional learning in these environments and that we're not only culturally aware but multiculturally relevant and safe. And it takes a village to build trust. It takes a village to plan for the better, the, the plan for a future that is better for our children, a future that is better than the now, a future that holds more promise, a future that allows us to be vulnerable and to learn from our mistakes. It takes a village to understand the benefits of having the voice of families and parents and grandparents at the table. Um, it takes a, a village to understand all of this that I'm saying to you today. And so with my story as a backdrop and being fully vulnerable to you right now, I speak to you, all of you, are you with me? Are you part of this village? If so, I want you to virtually arise in your spaces because it's our task to accomplish this work together. Our voices together are strong and mighty and we can do it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melvette. Um, I think that gets us all grounded and ready for some of the deep content we're going to get um, now uh, as, as we move forward. And Michelle Levy is going to walk us through uh, our statement around expulsionary practices. Um, some of you may not know this, but children are much more likely to be expelled from preschool than they are to be expelled from public school. Um, so this is an issue unique to early childhood. And I think Dr. Gilliam will have a lot to say about that in a little bit. But Michelle, uh, do you want to take it away now? Sure. Thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm glad to be here and to um, talk about this important topic. So um, I was, no, that's a hard act to follow um, to talk about a statement. Um, but I think that a lot of what we're sharing is going to be um, helpful for everyone. Um, I'm going to share some slides uh, to just kind of guide us through and give us some visuals here. So, do that. Um, so part of the reason for this webinar is to introduce the OEC statement on exclusionary discipline uh, and an accompanying uh, executive summary as well. The OEC statement on exclusionary discipline outlines existing policies and program standards that are related to this issue. It also highlights resources that are available to support early care and education programs so that they can prevent those challenging behaviors as much as possible 
and then positively address those behaviors when they do arise. The primary focus of this statement is to foster a collaborative approach to preventing the use of exclusionary discipline. Just what Melvet was you know, speaking to with that village um, to support children and families. One of our goals today is to create a collective call to action so we can all focus on taking on, in, focus in on solutions together. We know providers do not want to exclude children from their programs. And that when children are excluded, it's generally because they see it as the only solution or the last resort in a very stressful situation. And we know programs are under a lot of stress. You're dealing with staffing challenges and have many children coming into your programs who have experienced more stress and fewer social experiences because of the pandemic. And the pandemic has also impacted the stress and resiliency of the adults. So we're here to talk a bit about some of the issues, share some of the many resources available to support programs so you know you aren't alone in this work, and to hopefully set the stage for more dialogue and collective action. So what is exclusionary discipline? A good place is to start to define the term. So exclusionary discipline is a term we use to refer to practices that separate a child from their care and education. It includes suspension, which refers to temporary separations. Suspensions might involve a child being removed from a classroom for a period of time or may involve a child going home. Expulsion refers to removing a child on a more permanent basis. Informal removals may be either temporary or permanent, but they aren't necessarily referred to or formally documented in the way that you might expect a suspension or expulsion to be done. But it's important to think about all of these in the same way that we think about suspension and expulsion, because even if there's a difference in the words, the end result is often the same. Whether families are asked to pick up a child who's having a hard day or a more formal suspension occurs, the impact to the child the family and the program staff are often very similar. So who does exclusionary discipline impact? It impacts the village that Melvet was referring to. Um, when a child's asked to leave an early care and education program, whether it's temporary or permanent, it impacts the children, the families, program staff, and the community. A child who's suspended or expelled is clearly impacted. They're no longer able to benefit from the enriching experience. Their relationships and routines are disrupted. We know from research, as has been mentioned, that there's long-term negative outcomes associated with suspension and expulsion. Research has also shown us that there are higher rates of suspension and expulsion for African-American and Hispanic boys. Later on, you'll hear that recorded message from Dr. Walter Gilliam, and it'll address some of those disparities in more detail. Not only are the children who are suspended or expelled impacted, but the other children in the room are affected as well. They're part of that village. I know many early care and education providers struggle with the impact of behavior that they're concerned about on the other children in the classroom. But we also know when a child's asked to leave, this sends many different messages to the other children in the room and it can disrupt their social relationships and routines. We also know exclusionary discipline impacts families. Families whose child is suspended or expelled often deal with financial loss, stress, uncertainty, missed opportunities related to work or education. Communities are impacted because there's strain on schools, community resources, loss, they lose members of their workforce, um, and they deal with the impacts of some of those longer term negative outcomes associated with suspension and expulsion, such as grade retention, dropping out, and incarceration. We anticipate many of our many of those in our audience today are early care and education providers. And we know you're impacted by exclusionary discipline. There's a lot of stress, fear, and anxiety associated with the behavior that might be challenging in a situation or it's unsafe. Um, and with communicating with families about these challenges. Um, I'm sure that anyone entering the field of early childhood wants to support young children in their care. 
And when you feel that you don't have the knowledge or the skills or the supports that allow you to do this with every child, it can be really upsetting. That's why we wanna focus in on what supports we currently have in place and engage in more collaboration to address this issue together. No one has the answer or the strategies that are gonna help every single child. We've gotta to work together um, and, and do, you know, to, to make sure we have those supports there for all kids. The impacts on children, families, providers, and communities are some of the reasons to address exclusionary discipline. But as we mentioned, this is also an issue of racial equity. We know this from the research on disparities as to who's more likely to be suspended or expelled. I wanted to highlight the OEC statement on racial equity and the work we're doing. OEC's work on suspension and expulsion is a part of our overall work to address racial equity, as well as being an effort to support ECE programs, providers, and to promote social and emotional competence for all young children. So this OEC statement was an outgrowth of the OEC suspension and expulsion work group, a subcommittee of the OEC Advancing Equity and Anti-Racism Committee. Next, this work group's planning to begin to look at how we might gather and consider data as a supportive way to track progress, highlight needs, and target resources. This slide includes the names of my great team, the behind the scenes that have, have worked hard um, on this, this topic and this work. So as I mentioned, the OEC statement on exclusionary discipline is intended to focus on collective solutions. It includes strategies that can help programs take preventative and responsive measures to help children remain in programs when they have begun to, where they've already begun to establish relationships. It includes initiatives and resources that you can access for support, and you'll hear more about some of those shortly. It also outlines all of the existing policies and program standards that relate to the issue of exclusionary discipline, or at least most of them. Um, we've tried to encompass the, the most uh, um, prevalent ones, and it includes licensing regulations, some civil rights laws, and Connecticut le legislation addressing suspension and expulsion for children in preschool to grade two in public schools. It's easy to see policies as something imposed on people, um, but policies can provide a strong backbone and guide for navigating really tricky situations. You can use these regulations as a foundation and build strong, consistent practices that can really be helpful as you're navigating difficult conversations with families and trying to find a path forward when you're in the midst of a stressful situation and you're not sure what to do next. Program standards such as the Head Start Performance Standards and Accreditation Standards can also provide ideas and guidance, whether or not you're actively involved in those systems at this time. I wanna stress again that primary focus of this statement we want to foster a collaborative approach to prevent the use of exclusionary discipline. Just as exclusionary discipline impacts many people, the solutions must also involve many people. We have to work together across sectors, across that whole village. Programs can develop proactive and supportive program policies that help guide them through difficult situations and help them communicate with families about the steps they're taking. Programs also play a role in providing staff training and support. And the OEC, community organizations also help as they help ensure there's high quality coaching, training, and other supports available. Programs, higher education, and providers themselves can continue to work providing culturally competent and responsive care and support. We also need to ensure there's strong community networks, resources for families struggling to make ends meet, coping with trauma or mental health challenges, all the other many stressors that exist. We also know children's developmental needs can impact their ability to regulate emotions, communicate, gain social skills, so that often comes out in the way of behavior. So strong screening and referral systems are also part of the community networks and family partnerships that are needed. 
Community resources can also play an important role in making sure the teachers and the program staff have what they need to take care of themselves and allow them to be more present and effective when they're facing those challenging situations. I can't stress enough the importance of building those strong partnerships with families. I think Melvette did a wonderful job of, of conveying that the importance of that and, and the richness of those opportunities. Um, and of course, that's related to the culturally competent care and support, understanding your community, understanding each other, um, and working from a place of, of mutual respect and care and uh, understanding. Finally, a quick mention of data and reflection. Data doesn't necessarily mean scary numbers, spreadsheets, accountability. Collecting information about children's behavior and responses helps us identify trends, find trouble spots, and take action. This can occur at a program or classroom level where a provider or teacher might notice a challenging behavior is happening during a particular time of day or that many children are having trouble with certain times of the day. You can adjust routines and actions to prevent those behaviors. Or it can occur at the community or state level where we might notice trends that help us improve systems and target professional development and more. As you know, this is a complex issue with a lot of with a variety of factors that at play at each and every dif difficult situation. Every different situation has a different variety of factors, so it's a complex picture. Um, and their strategies to address this issue need to be collaborative, responsive, and complex as well. So again, this is stage setting or call to kind of collaborative action, a start to the work. I want to share one next step, um, and that's a webinar being offered by the Yukon Health Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities. Um, they're providing a webinar on uh, behavior management policies. So they're, um, it's taking place on October 19th from 3 to 4 p.m., um, creating those strong proactive behavior policies can help you and families navigate those, those challenging situations. And so this will provide some support in crafting those. The registration link is included here, which you probably can't click on in Zoom, but we're gonna make sure that the PowerPoint with the other links to the statements as well um, will be made available to registrants following the webinar. And we'll make sure things are posted on our website as well. Another step in our collaborative effort to reduce exclusionary discipline is to gather input from you. If you scan this code, it will take you to something called a Padlet. And there you can add comments regarding any questions you have, successes you want to share, challenges that you still need help with, and ideas to improve our support system. You're going to hear about some initiatives um, coming up, but you know, you may have great ideas that we um, can consider ways to improve what we're doing and new things that um, might help. We know a large webinar like this doesn't lend itself to other types of input and conversation and that deep conversation is what's needed to tackle these issues. So this is a first step, gaining a little bit of insight from you um, and starting to look at this um, together. In a moment, I'll also share the link to the Padlet in the chat, if that works better for folks. So as I mentioned, one of the immediate next steps we're taking as a part of this webinar is to share more information about the resources that are already in place that can support you. Shortly, you'll hear from a panel about four key OEC-supported behavioral health initiatives that are supportive of the effort to reduce exclusionary discipline. The panel will be led by OEC Behavioral Health Initiatives Program Manager, Dr. Lorna thomas Ferguson. This journey isn't an easy one. The situations can be stressful, and it's so important you take care of yourself if you're going to support others. Melvette mentioned this, and it's um, so important. So to get us thinking about the importance of our own well-being, Dr. thomas Ferguson is going to guide us in a little quick activity. I'm going to turn it over to her. Thank you so much, Michelle. And 
thank you all of you who are here. The fact that you are here already shows your investment in the topic we're talking about. And we had a wonderful opening keynote address from Melvette Hill. Melvette, thank you so very much again of reminding us of the importance of collaboration with our families and that it certainly takes a village to help raise and support our children. And we certainly know that later on with our webinar, we're going to be hearing from panelists who are going to help give helpful information to support providers, to support those working directly with our young people people in various settings. But before we do that, I, I just have a quick, quick question for all of you who are watching, a little quick assignment. As you look at this picture here, I want you to put your educator's hat on. In whatever setting you may educate young people, I want you to think of yourself and how you implement the tools to help your young people learn. And as you look at the scene right here, I want you to imagine that you are going to be taking the young people you work with on a field trip. What assignment would you give them to explore what's around them and how they can learn from what's around them? Also, what assignment would you give them to explore and learn more about themselves as they're growing from young people into older people and into adults? So again, as you look at the scene right here, I want you to think, well, what directions will you give the young people you work with to help them learn more about what's around them? And what assignment would you give them to help them learn more about themselves? And we'll take a moment of quietness just for you to think of that. I wonderful. I'm seeing persons put things into the chat. Yes. Continue to put them in. And what's wonderful is within seconds, started to see suggestions put into the chat. Whether you're putting them in the chat or you were writing them down or you're thinking of them in your head, you have quickly responded to the question of how to help our young people use the scenery around them to help them learn what's around them and also to help them learn more about themselves. And I will read what is shared in the chat and for the wonderful suggestions and they, they continue to continue to come in. So I'll just read just some of them, which include what's hidden in the shadows that's covered up by the sun's ray. It's a very good question. What feelings come up to you as you watch this picture? Some other suggestions. How do you feel? What do you smell? Close your eyes. Wonderful. And they continue to come in. Now, now I'm going to have us to, to pause for a brief moment and, and to pivot. I'm not at all surprised that you all, just like that, were able to respond to the question the question helping our young people to learn what's around them, how they can learn from what's around them and also how they can learn more about themselves. When it came to the question being asked to you as it applies to helping the young people, you quickly responded. And again, not surprised, that shows what wonderful educators and supporters you are. But I want us to pivot. I'm going to ask a question again. And it may seem like, well, you asked the same question, but no, no. It's going to be a little bit different. This time, I want you to take off your educator's hat and I want you to put on your own hat, your own hat of self care and self reflection. And the same question I'm asking to you as you look at this scene what can you do for yourself to help yourself learn more of what's around you? And how can you learn more about yourself? If you were in this exact setting right now, what would you want to do for yourself? What activity would you want to engage in for yourself? Not so much to benefit someone else, but something you may be curious about. And how may that curiosity have you to learn more about yourself? So once again, we'll take a brief moment to pause to reflect in that way. Again, this is your own hat that's on right now.
The reason for the pivot is because you all are so vital and so needed in helping us educate and raise our young people. And we know that our young people are going to be and currently are our future leaders, our leaders for tomorrow. So it's so important that we invest in them today. But in order to fully invest in them, we first have to invest in ourselves. We are no good to anyone else unless we take care of ourselves. Now you all quickly responded to the question when it was about others, when it was about how to help others, how to educate others. I hope you were able to quickly or rather respond with as much ease when the question was focused on yourself, when it was focused on what you can do for yourself to help you explore what's around you, what you can do to help you learn more about yourself. And for those of you who were able to readily think of something wonderful, and for those of you where it may have taken a little bit of time, or maybe you said, I, I'm not sure, I I'm, haven't thought of that. I'm so used to taking care of others. I really put myself second or third, or maybe even fourth, fifth, or sixth. Then to you, we encourage you to take more of that time. Why? Because we need you. And you can only give to us if you are taking care of yourself. So as you look at this picture, let this be a reminder of how important you are to so many, but the most important person you are important to is yourself. And please do remember that self-care is not at all selfish. Self-care is important for us to be able to give back to others all the more. And so with that, we'll take the picture down. Michelle, thank you so much. And want to once again, thank Michelle for her leadership with the work group. And that is what has helped bring us here today. We are here to talk with you, not to talk at you. We want to be solution focused as Melvet shared, and we want to do this together. And with doing that together, we have teammates here to help us share what resources are available when it comes to supporting the young people in the classroom, even those who may have challenging behaviors. So let me first now begin by introducing who is on our esteemed panel. First, we have the Pyramid Model Consortium. The Pyramid Model is a framework of evidence-based practices for promoting young children's healthy social and emotional development and for preventing challenging behaviors using a strength-based approach. The National Center for Pyramid Model Innovations promotes policies and practices that advance equity, diversity, and the full inclusion and participation of all young children and their families in early care and educational environments. The pyramid model practices and implementation approaches affirm and celebrate the unique identities of young children and their families across all social identities. We are honored to have with us Paquita Jermaine Smith, who is a master cadre of the pyramid model coach and mentor of the Connecticut Pyramid Partnership State Leadership Team. We also are honored to have Christopher Badenhop, who is Master Cadre Pyramid Model Mentor Coach, School Readiness Liaison as well. Thank you so much. Moving on to our other panelists, we have Connecticut Association for Infant Mental Health, or CTA. CTA is a professional statewide nonprofit organization that offers education and expertise in infant and early childhood mental health. CTA promotes and holds a set of competency guidelines that when they are met, lead to an endorsement in culturally sensitive relationship-focused practices promoting infant or early childhood mental health. CTAIM's mission is to promote, support, and strengthen nurturing quality relationships for infants, young children, and their caregivers within the context of family, community, and culture through education, advocacy, and professional development. CTAIM's hope is that all infants and young children in Connecticut will experience nurturing, responsive care through strong relationships that ensure optimal social and emotional growth and development. Infant mental health training series offered includes home visitor services, child care series, DCF and community partner series, and reflective supervision series. We are honored to have with us from CT AIM, Heidi Madeira, who is the executive director of, of CT AIMS of Connecticut Association for Infant Mental Health. 
Heidi was a former preschool teacher and director, has also worked as a home visitor, coordinator, and trainer presenter. Along with her, we are honored to have Ann Giordorno, who is a trainer coordinator for the Connecticut Association for Infant Mental Health and Early Childhood Specialist, Specialist with Ed Advance. Anne has extensive experience on training, presenting about infant and early childhood mental health. Thank you both so much. We also have on our panel, Help Me Grow Sparkler. Help Me Grow is part of the United Way of Connecticut 211 Child Development Unit. 211 Child Development is the centralized access point in the state of Connecticut for providers and families to obtain information, resources, and referrals about children's development, learning, and behaviors. 211 Child Development Unit is composed of Birth to Three, Help Me Grow, Early Childhood Special Education, and Children and Youth with Special Health Care Needs, funded by several state organizations, such as the Office of Early Childhood, State Department of Education, Department of Public Health, and United Way of Connecticut. Help Me Grow is designed to increase awareness and knowledge of the importance of developmental monitoring, screening, and linking to appropriate services with a particular focus on children who are not el eligible for birth to three or early childhood special education. Care coordinators are available to answer families' questions or simply are seeking information about their child or children. Help Me Grow is a national model with four core components, centralized access point, family and community outreach, healthcare outreach, and data collection and analysis. We are honored to have with us from Help Me Grow and Sparkler, Dr. Luz Rivera, Program Manager of Help Me Grow and Sparkler, and also Julia Levy, the Executive Director of Sparkler. And then we have last, but certainly not least on our panel, Early Childhood Consultation Partnership, or ECCP. The Early Childhood Consultation Partnership is a statewide infant and early childhood mental health consultation program. The program was developed and is managed by Advanced Behavioral Health. ECCP is funded by grants from DCF and OEC and is available at no cost to all child care programs and family child care providers statewide, providing services to children birth to five years old. ECCP consultants work on site with administrators, teachers and educators, and families to help support the social, emotional, and relational development of young children. We are honored to have from ECCP, Dr. Yola Borto, Director of Early Childhood Consultation Partnership, Advanced Behavioral Health. She is Director of ECCP and also is a clinical child psychologist and has been with ECCP program for nine years, initially joining the program as an ECCP consultant in the Norwalk office. Along with Dr. Borto, we are honored to have Samantha West, Senior Consultant with ECCP. Samantha has been with ECCP, a consultant rather, for over four years. She works at community guidance clinics for Central Connecticut. She values collaborating creatively with caregivers and has worked with families with young children for over 20 years using a relationally play-based approach. And then we are honored to have Heston Sutman, who is the principal of Kathleen E. Goodman Elementary School in Old Saybrook. Heston has been a principal of Goodwin School for nine years. The school includes pre-K through grades four and currently has six sections of pre-K. They provide free tuition pre-K, which was phased in over a three-year period. They are a restorative classroom school and use a play-based curriculum. Mr. Sutman has partnered with ECCP for his preschool classrooms. And so collectively, welcoming all of you, thank you so much for joining us for being with us and helping to engage in a wonderful, robust discussion. And so with that, we will proceed with our first question. There are a few key things that can help to prevent challenging behavior from occurring, including building strong relationships with children, setting up environments for success, teaching social and emotional skills, and building positive, culturally responsive relationships with families. I'm going to ask each of you to touch upon one of these preventative measures. How does Connecticut Association for Infant Mental Health support providers to building strong, trusting relationships with children? Thank you so much, Lorna. Um, 
I just wanted to take one second uh, to start and say hello to all of you. I'm so happy to see so many of you, some of you I know, um, and just maybe take a moment to settle in and uh, just take a deep breath or two. Maybe feel your shoulders relax a little down. I do that because not only is it good for all of us, it is also good for me as a presenter um, to take a little moment to calm down. A lot of us um, maybe practice some co-regulating skills uh, some of them which are having someone with you to present together with, and other times it's doing a few things that calm, get us calm before we begin. Um, so that's just a little grounding exercise that's helpful. It's something also that can be used in your classroom. My, uh, I have a new granddaughter. She's almost two. And um, my daughter has just started uh, this with her when she starts running around the room hitting everything because I frustrated uh and she says let's take a deep breath together and she stops and she goes and um it's just it's interesting to see in someone so close to me but how um do we support these early relationships with the Connecticut Association for Infant Mental Health as you mentioned we are a statewide organization that one of the things we focus on is supporting the workforce and the workforce is you. You are the ones working with children zero to six and their families and you are really critical. You're so important in the lives of children. And so for us, um, we look at first in any of our training series, starting with you and expressing how important your role is, why it's important and number one, as far as what infant mental health is, it's focusing in on the, that relationship with infants, young children, and their caregivers. And you are one of the primary caregivers in the lives of a child. You are one of their attachment figures. And to understand what that looks like when you're attaching with a child, um, it's a relationship where a child can develop in. They are only are developing and learning in the context of relationships. And as a caregiver, that's one of the most important relationships that they have is being with you. Um, you're a brain builder. You're in every interaction you have, you're building the brains of children. Their connections are just firing like crazy, all that you're curious about and expose them to in your environment. And those relationships are critical. They're critical for children to learn more about themselves. I matter, I'm important. People pay attention to me, they love me, I can count on them to respond to my needs. All of those things are things that we include in our training series and speak to. And I just wanna introduce Anne Giordano, our training coordinator, to just talk a little bit more about some of the particular topics that we discuss in our training series and how we intentionally frame it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Heidi, um, and welcome everybody. It's an honor to be here with all of you. Um, it's so heartening for me to have heard or for us to have heard the early statements given because I think it made my job today very easy because everything that we have talked about is what we try to embed and intentionally plan for within our training series. So um, Heidi used those words that we are attached. We really emphasize the critical role of providers, help them to understand not only are you just here with them, you are building brains. Every interaction, every opportunity that you have with a child or a family is an opportunity to support the growth of that child. So our series are very intentionally designed with really, in uh, regardless of who the audience is, kind of a three-pronged model. Um, and we frame that using some infant mental health language, starting with ways of knowing. So we're very intentional about um, creating strong foundational content knowledge in a variety of topics, some uh, about 10 of them in the early care series, looking at things like um, Foundations of infant toddler development and behavior, uh, attachment, trauma, brain development, um, 
understanding the importance of play, right? All of these kinds of things. And probably one of the most important ones, which was touched upon so eloquently today by Melvet and others, is partnering with families. The success of a child in an early care program is significantly contingent upon the success of the relationship that the caregiver has with the family. So um, we, we frame them in what we kind of call lenses. So we have our participants think about developing uh, better skills around the attachment lens, the developmental lens, uh, the trauma lens, most certainly, and the um, and the cultural lens, which overlays everything. Um, secondary, secondarily to that, we look at ways of, of doing, and ways of doing are really thinking about um, imparting what we know to be the best practice skills and strategies uh, framed uh, by the world of infant mental health, um, embedding not just our content knowledge, but thinking about listening, observing, meeting without judgment, right? Really using those four lenses when trying to understand not only the behavior of children, but also maybe the behaviors of the adults, their most important adults in their lives, right? And then uh, the third one is kind of what we call maybe the most important, which is the ways of being. Um, and this was touched upon, right? And we do that by creating not just a training series, but a training series that's really embedded in imparting the parallel process, uh, creating from the very beginning um, an environment of safety and comfort for our, uh, our participants, really offering them time um, to connect with one another, to build relationship with one another, and to have that sense of, uh, as Jerry Paul, right, our infant mental health uh, guru tells us, learning about how we do unto others as we would want others to do unto others. So really building that atmosphere of um, safety, security, and connection. Thank you so much, Heidi and Anne. Uh, certainly words of, of, of wisdom and words of information that it can be applied in many ways. Thank you so much. And so with that, moving on to same question again, but I'll phrase it a little bit differently uh, to our pyramid team. How does the pyramid model work in Connecticut? Help programs set up predictable environments that help children be successful. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Paquita Jarman-Smith. I work at the State Education Resource Center. I'm one of the members of the Connecticut Pyramid um, um, leadership team, as well as being a coach to some of the programs. So I'm really happy to be here with you all to talk about the role of a predictable environment that helps our children to be successful. So um, along with some of the visualization that we've had today, I want you to envision as I talk your space, some of the best spaces that you've seen, the relationships and opportunities that you notice for children that are going to increase their, their learning on social emotional development, um, support um, um, early childhood programs in preventing and decreasing challenging behaviors while promoting positive social and emotional development. Um, Connecticut is fortunate to have um, statewide training. Um, I collaborate with the Department of Education. I do some statewide trainings on the pyramid model. You'll see those coming up soon. I'm also um, a coach for a program, and we offer training, on-site coaching for, for the uh, programs, and um, that can be focused on the environment to ensure that our teachers who are implementing Pyramid know how to be equitable for all of the diverse children and learners that we have. We have multilingual learners, students with disabilities from a range of ability and interests that we have to think about. And we're really focused on helping them both socially as well as cognitively grow and development. So I'm going to share some examples of what, um, as a program model coach, I do to support the teachers and programs. There are lots of tools and resources that we can use um, to assess classrooms. Um, we use those tools when we're doing classroom observations. We meet with the program members. 
provide feedback, find out what training needs they might have, um, focus on social, emotional growth and development. Um, and all of this is in the context of what you've heard earlier about high quality learning environments. So predictable environments, they have what young children need to be successful and engaged. Predictability ensures that children have multiple opportunities throughout the day to engage in learning. We ourselves have routines and we know how important consistency is for supporting children. And I too, like many of you, am raising a young child. He's now eight. I've been in and out of programs for some years and it's nothing more exciting than seeing kids who are engaged and learning and the teachers and all the providers that are putting so much commitment into that and making that happen. So within early childhood, we have home base, we have center base and other iterations of learning environments. And these environments should intentionally have regularly scheduled learning activities that address a whole child. You will see um, daily visual schedules for children to look at, as well as refer to throughout the day. Those schedules have choice activities that are play-based and culturally relevant, and include and connect to all of those um, learning materials in the environment. So the centers, the housekeeping, the art area, all of those things are going to support the child's development and are included in the routines. In terms of these routines, um, they're thoughtfully embedded. They embed all the domains of learning. So you'll notice physical development, motor development, cognitive development, and social social emotional skill development. So I'm gonna take you through the day looking at those routines and what it might look like. Um, I'm sure you can add and and chat some of the things that you're doing. So we're going to start with reading children and families, um, ensuring that the children are settled um, and know that when they come to your program, they're welcome and that they belong. Um, Morning meetings, they include songs and movement games that build our brains, build the children's brains. When you're working with young children and thinking about your diapering and toileting routine, that has all about the relationship and the interactions, the smile, the comfort that children are um, experiencing from you as they go throughout their, their routine of diapering. Meal times and snacks, they're great places to invite families to contribute their thoughts about what kids should be eating. Um, And you can intentionally engage some learning about friendship skills. So when you're you're serving meals, the kids are taking turns. Um, They're learning about caring for other people. They're learning about all the diverse foods in the world as they eat. Um, Free choice, um, you'll see some expectations for children to have so they know how to play with each other, how to learn with each other. Story time has some embedded opportunities for children to look at books on on the um, program-wide expectations that you have for them in terms of their behavior and learning. They'll see books and have activities that relate to all cultures, all abilities. And um, one of the things that I, I always gravitate to or the picture books, you know, wonderful books like All Because You Matter so that kids know that they belong. Um, Math, science, you know, you'll see building blocks, kids are counting, Um, science and nature, like that that picture that that Lorna shared with us, it's, it's really important that those experiences you know, they can be they can be healing experiences when you connect outdoor learning to playtime. You know, they can look at the environment. They can have time and opportunities to roll their bodies through using the climbers, the trikes, and the bikes. And all of these things are planned so that children have choices and opportunities to play with their friends as well as have time alone. The end of the day um, routine. That can include 
kids coming together with you to process learning of the day, to say their goodbyes. And as families come in, you check in with them, they check in with you, you share information about what the child focused on and delighted in that day. And all of these things really, really ensure that families are aware there is a routine and that sometimes they can even model some of the things that you're doing within their own homes. Um, I'm going to uh, move on a little bit okay. more. Oh, and Paquita, talk. Paquita, I am so sorry. I am so absorbing all that you are sharing and such the wonderful information and want to hear so much more. We have more questions for you and the team, though. So, oh, okay. so, so that's all right. I'm going to gonna have us to, to move right along. We're going to put a dot, dot, dot right there. But thank, thank you, you so. Oh, thank you so very much. Thank you. But we're going to come back to you all. All right. So. Again, the same question, but with a little a twist to it. How does Sparkler support both providers and families to teaching social and emotional skills? Um, I think that one's for me. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, Lorna, first, I want to thank you and the whole team, um, well, for your ongoing partnership, but for really focusing everybody today on this important topic. And I'm so glad that you included us um, in today's session, so thank you. Um, so in answer to your question, I'm going to hopefully quickly highlight three things that Sparkler does to support social and emotional learning for both providers and families. Um, first, we provide access through the app to developmental screening, which helps families to learn about child development, to celebrate milestones, and to access early intervention if that's what they need. Um, over the whole time we've been working with OEC, which is a few years, we've seen, um, as of today, 10,128 ASQSEs completed using Sparkler in Connecticut, um, and the SE stands for social and emotional, and that's something that parents are consistently, and I would say increasingly, interested in and concerned about. Um, and the ASQSE, which is available through Sparkler as well as the ASQ3, measures um, seven core um, social and emotional behavioral areas. So it helps parents learn about their children's self-regulation, compliance, adaptive functioning, autonomy, affect, social communication, and interaction. And that's really important in sort of helping to build knowledge among parents um, and caregivers and educators and all the other serving families about how children are developing and what skills um, they might need more support in developing in the early years. Um, the second thing I wanted to highlight is that in the, in the app in Sparkler, we have a ton of content that helps families and providers to promote social and emotional learning. We have a whole library of content within the app that families can use to explore and discover new ways to support their children's SEL. Um, they can discover content within the app as parents and providers who are using Sparkler to engage with families can use the dashboard, which is the way providers use Sparkler, to identify and send activities to parents um, to help them address concerns that they have about their children's early learning um, and development. And that can be following screening, like if they do have a expressed concern on the screening, or it could be any time a parent comes in with a question and is wondering how they can support their child um, in this area. At this point, we have more than 2,000 activities that parents can use in the app um, that promote play-based learning. And we also have about 100 parent tip units that can support parents and caregivers as they learn about different areas of early childhood development. Um, and each play activity in Sparkler is focused on developing a primary skill and a secondary skill. We have four domains, heart, words, mind, and body. And I know heart is the one that we usually think of when we think of social and emotional learning, but in early childhood, everything is connected. So they're all involved in learning to express yourself or learning um, to solve problems, which is undermined in Sparkler's domains. Um, they're all really connected to children's wellness and social and emotional development and health. Um, at, within heart, the, the sub skills are feelings, identity, self regulation, trust, empathy, curiosity, persistence, and independence. Um, and anybody who has any questions about how we are, um, about our content, I'm happy to answer. Um, a few highlights of content that we have within the app. So we have 
a social and emotional learning podcast called Little Kids Big Hearts, which is available within the app. And it's hosted by a preschool teacher who talks with real kids about big issues in SEL. Our latest episode, which was about self-regulation, had this beautiful guided imagination vacation led by an, a Broadway actress, Rebecca Naomi Jones, um, who, and advised by a child psychologist who uses these sorts of visualizations as a part of her work with young children. So um, that, that's one great highlight. We also have um, a whole social and emotional um, unit, which we created with partners called Big Heart World, and all of that is available within the app. We have parent tips to help parents and caregivers, as I said before, um, to learn about identity, coping with stress, big feelings, much, much more. And to link it back to a previous speaker, we've adapted a lot of the pyramid content, um, and that's available through the app for families to sort of give, make it a one-stop shop where parents and caregivers can learn um, about different things that they can do to support children's early learning around, around social and emotional um, and the third thing I wanted to highlight, which is quick, is we have a new SEL curriculum called Us Time that we've been putting together. Um, and we've been working with partners to develop it. It's aligned with um, the Connecticut standards. And um, the idea is to help teachers who are working with young children to grow social emotional skills. Um, it incorporates songs, movement, puppets, et cetera, et cetera, to build skills around feelings, community, identity, similarities, and differences, and more. And all of it's linked up with the in-app content. So families who are experiencing Sparkler at Home can have this connection to what's happening at school. And it all comes back to helping children and their families and their teachers and all the other providers who are serving families to work together um, to learn social and emotional skills, which um, ideally children will start learning the day they're born. And as we all know, we continue learning through our entire lives. So um, that's my, my short answer to your question, Lorna. Um, and I'm happy to answer any other follow-ups that come up on the panel. Certainly. Thank you so much, Julia. Wonderful information. And to know that Sparkler is a resource available to all of our children throughout the state of Connecticut. So thank you so much. You. And again, with the same question, which I will repeat, recognizing that there are several key things that can help to prevent challenging behaviors from occurring, including building strong relationships with children, setting up environments for success, teaching social and emotional skills, and building positive, culturally responsive relationships with children. For ECCP, how can ECCP support programs to build positive, culturally responsive relationships with families? Thank you, Lorna, for your question. And thank you for inviting ECCP to be here. We're happy to be here with one of our senior consultants, Samantha, and also one of the participants in our program, Heston. So we're gonna kind of answer this question in conjunction together. First, I just wanna share for anybody who's listening in the audience a little bit about what ECCP offers. So we have classroom-based supports where our consultants come out um, and work with administrators and teachers um, to provide support for the whole classroom or for an FCCP provider for your whole program. We also have child level supports where our consultants will come out to work with the classroom or FCCP provider and a family member to support the specific social, emotional, and relational needs of a particular child. And really at the heart of our work is building partnerships. And so as our speakers earlier talked about, it's so important for all the adults to be working together and to have that village to support young children when there are some challenges or concerns about their social, emotional, and relational development. And so we really take a curious, wondering stance to learn from one another and to be able to better understand one another as we think about the child and what they're expressing through their behavior, because we know behavior has meaning. So I'm going to pass to Samantha and then to Heston to talk a little bit about what that looks like in practice. Thank you, Yola. So the way we do this is we join together um, in meetings with both teachers and parents, directors, principals, and together with the consultant that covers the particular region of the state, we hold the beliefs that the caregivers are all doing the best that they can with what they have. And when we join, we really aim to be curious of one another's goals and approaches, 
cultural backgrounds and expectations. Um, and as consultants, we've worked to identify the child's strengths and areas of growth opportunities. And as we look to really merge these different perspectives, we do this all while working to align and prioritize the caregiver's hopes for the child's experience. Caring for young children is really heavily influenced by our culture and our beliefs and what is best for the child. So some of these beliefs may be very strong and can bring up a lot in caregivers. Um, and if any providers on the call have not yet had the chance to partner with ECCP, um, if you go to eccpct.com, you can find the consultant that covers your region. Asked to Heston to share a little bit about his experience with ECCP in terms of how ECCP has been able to help him build relationships with families too. So I'm a lucky guy. I get to go to a meeting. I sit down with Samantha and the family and she lays out a plan. It is safe. She's a neutral person that's not passing any judgment. Uh, she's sincere. She's empathetic. And she gives the family realistic and the team, the whole team, realistic strategies to help children. And the best thing I can say is she empowers them. So maybe they're feeling a bit um, overwhelmed by the situation or they're a bit embarrassed that they have a need. But Samantha comes in and through the ECCP and their program and their procedures, I, I'm lucky guy. I see this program being successful for our kids and for our parents. And it's not something that just lasts a couple of weeks. I, I've seen kids turn it around and families turn around for the rest of the school year. And now subsequent school years, they still have those skills and those parents have been empowered and it works. So I'm a big fan of ECCP. Uh, specifically Samantha, because the work she does, it works. And just like Melvette said, you know, they had a need and someone came in and took action and made a difference and it worked. And this is what Samantha does for our families. And it's really terrific. Boy, Samantha and Heston and Yola, boy, thank you so very much. And we know how, how influential collectively you are. And we greatly appreciate those efforts. And so we're going to continue on with another question because we want to hear more words of wisdom from our panelists here. This one is directed to our Sparkler team, our Help Me Grow Sparkler team. So we know that even when you put all of these preventative measures in place, there will still be some children who need additional supports to learn and to use social and emotional skills. How does Help Me Grow and also with Sparkler help with making sure children have the supports they need? Thank you, Lorna. Um, I, I have to say thank you to this whole entire group as well. I concur with everything that has been said thus far, but I also want to affirm boldly that I am with Melvet, ensuring the support children need to thrive, grow, and dream. And so Sparkler mobile app is the modern technology to access um, developmental and social emotional questionnaires for parents and providers. Um, the library, uh, full of play activities, just like Julia said, the parent tips around child development, and the direct access to 211 child development um, unit. That direct access to a care coordinator in United Way is critical in the process of the importance of the follow up. And so that is the point of entry and families and providers have that, that direct access by using the Sparkler mobile app. Um, access to resources, real, reliable information um, and referrals in our state. The most important thing when a family needs additional support to learn and use social and emotional skill is the follow-up. The follow-up can vary across family and situations. And so it may range from sending a family play activities through Sparkler um, or parent tips um, as well, and or a direct referral from 211. By having that direct access to 211 child development care coordinators via the Sparkler mobile app, the family and care coordinator can communicate, can join together via a two-way messaging. So Sparkler now also offers a follow-up form to document and record the next steps once a family completes an ASQ screening. 
Once the screening has been completed and is submitted through Sparkler, either by the parent or the provider, the new follow-up form becomes available to the provider to complete on the Sparkler dashboard to keep track of the recommendations for next steps. Providers may track, may fill out the form before or after they meet with the family. To use as a guiding um, way to those conversation of what is the next best step for that family. The follow-up form is a tool for providers to keep track of the next steps when having that conversation with family. And that relationship is really, really critical in the process of the follow-up. Depending on the situation or need, the care coordinators can respond to messages and or directly call the family. If further attention is needed beyond the two-way messaging feature, the 211 care coordinator will pick up the phone and call the family directly for further assessment and also by asking a series of questions and conduct research using the 211 database. More often than not, care coordinators find offering additional supports based on the phone call that families were not even aware of. This assessment affords a care coordinator to hear the parents' questions, concerns, ask their expert of their child, and align supports and program services according to their conversation and needs. And most importantly, engage them in the process of decision-making. The follow-up is an important and sometimes requires a, someone to simply listen and obtain parent input in the process to ensure family needs are heard and aligned to appropriate local community services. For example, like home visiting, support, birth to three, parenting support groups, mid-level developmental assessment, mental health evaluation, advocacies, early childhood special education, and children with special health care needs. By ensuring parent is a part of and guiding the follow-up process, care coordinators are listening and reassuring the family during a time of need to identify concrete services. 211 Child Development offers online form and believe it or not, fax as well to complete a referral and the care coordinator will reach out. Sometimes a pediatrician or a local community provider are busy, and so this may be a best way for them to connect with resources. In, a, in our state, we have different pathway to offer additional supports, such as direct access to Sparkler mobile app, and if further attention is needed by calling the family directly. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rivera. To know that the wide and, and, and uh, various wonderful ways that Help Me Grow is able to contribute back to Connecticut and helping our youngest of young, certainly Sparkler is evidence of that also. So thank you so much. This question here is for our CTA panelists, teammates. Even though it is a job that can be very personally rewarding, being an early childhood provider is also very hard. How does CT AIM help providers navigate the challenges of being an early care and education provider? Thank you, Lorna. You know, I, I think when we think about it, one of the most important things that we can do is create an environment in which our training participants have an opportunity to be acknowledged for how hard this work is and to be recognize their value. Um, we also really offer lots of very intentionally planned time for uh, re self reflection, for group reflection on how to implement the, the, the content knowledge and the strategies, how that they can really think about not just going to training, but thinking about what intentions am I making? What commitments can I make to really transfer this new knowledge and this new understanding into my work, as well as into thinking about how this information can shape policies um, and procedures? How are we truly going to welcome and team with families? How are we gonna think maybe a little bit differently about using that, that lens of attachment and thinking about how, how does, our plans around moving children, right? Um, how, how is that, are we rethinking that? Because 
that impacts attachment, right? How are we thinking about maybe assigning primary caregivers, which really can then support attachment, support a sense of safety for children, and hopefully reduce opportunities for uh, behavior. And then um, Heidi, I'll turn it to you just very briefly to talk about reflective supervision opportunities that are offered so that people can have ongoing support. Yeah, I think, um, thank you, Anne. The, the main takeaway for participants in our training series is that when you as a provider feel competent, you have, I have the knowledge, now I have skills and strategies, and also I'm really reflective on how I am as a provider, how I am with children, how I am with uh, their caregivers, um, you come away feeling um, more equipped to address what the particular needs are of children in your care. And um, one of the ways we can reflect on all of those things is to have an experience of reflective supervision. And right now we offer group reflective supervision where we have an endorsed professional who is a facilitator and participants come together in a group of six to eight and discuss the emotional um, toll this work takes on you. Um, feel supported around issues of what it what is it like to be a professional in this field? What is it like to be in my particular classroom? What is it like to be in my particular situation? And um, how do I feel supported in this work? And how can I be curious, wonder, and discover all of this uh, in this contained safe environment together with others? And so um, that's one thing that we offer as well. And when people go through our training series that we like them to also come back together for at least a year, once a month in a reflective supervision experience um, where you even learn, you learn other strategies like grounding exercises and ways to take care of yourself and be thoughtful of who you are as a co-regulator with young children that you need to take care of yourself first before you can be there for the children that are maybe having um, some challenges right now. And what does that mean? What does that mean for them? And what does it mean for you? And so um, all of that is, is uh, support and kind of someone putting their arms around you in a big hug <laughs> to say, you matter, you matter so much in the lives of children. And uh, there are others out there that can support you uh, through this time. So thank you. I'll just be shorter. Thank no, thank you so much. Thank you. And 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 I'm so we're so appreciative of all that's been shared. I, I have an, another question. I know our time is getting close, but I want to be able to try to soak up as much as possible. So please just want to bear bear with us, please, since we have these wonderful panel of experts here. Uh, the next question. No matter how much we focus on prevention and take care of our own physical and mental health, there will be behaviors that are challenging that occur and persist for a while. How does ECCP support programs to develop and implement a plan for addressing challenging behaviors? Such a great question, Lorna. You know, we know that when challenging or concerning behaviors occur, it can take a while before we can see some resolution. And so, like I mentioned before, our ECCP consultants come right out to providers and they work in collaboration with providers to develop what we refer to as an action plan that's based on having conversation with providers and family members and observing the child in their school environment and in their home environment. And then what our consultants do that Samantha and Heston referred to earlier is they work either in the classroom or in the program supporting adult caregivers in implementing the strategies that are outlined in the plan. And so they can answer questions in real time from caregivers in terms of what to do. They can get feedback when there was a real like wow moment of something that was super effective to really help a provider lean into that, to celebrate that success, to think about how to build upon that. Or if we try the strategy and it kind of flopped to kind of explore why that might be and what we might try to do differently. And so really that's like the heart of what ECCP can offer is creating a plan with you and then working with you as you implement the plan to support the children in your care and to support one another. Because really, as we've been mentioning all along, when adults are cared for and taken care of and take time, they're able to then meet the needs of um, some of these behaviors that present as really challenging and so I want to share um, some space with Samantha and Heston to talk a little bit more about what that could look like. 
Thanks, um, Yola. I'd also like to add that sometimes programs might wonder when to call ECCP and when to make a referral. And the best time to call, as you all may know, is early, right? There's so much we can do to help to promote social, emotional, and relational wellness. And when challenging behaviors have been occurring for over a period of time, it's really important to remember that it can sometimes take a while to form new routines and to help the child learn new sets of behaviors. So prevention and early intervention is definitely key. Michelle and, uh, talks about stress earlier, stress on the system, stress on the families. But when we have uh, a student in our classroom that behavior is a real problem, it stresses out all the other children as well. So Sam, we've, we've done this. We've worked together. We, we have done this and you have helped solve these problems for us. And a big part is, and what a dream it is to have Sam actually go to the home and observe. Not only observe the child, but observe the family, observe those interactions, and then do the same thing at school. See the interactions between peers and the teacher and the staff. And Sam makes sure that the plan has language that we all use to address that child's behavior. So when that child has a team using the same strategies, the same behavior, and then Sam is observing and coaching, the child really is put into a situation to be successful. And again, those behaviors um, are absorbed at a young age. These are three and four year olds and the families absorb what their language and behavior needs to be. And it has solved the problem for us. So again, I I'm a huge advocate of that approach. Cannot uh, disagree with you there. Excellent. Thank you so much. And I'm going to squeeze one last question in to our pyramid model teammates. How does the pyramid model work in Connecticut? Help providers collaborate and organize information that will help them continue to review and improve practices. Thank you, Lorna. I want to say, first of all, um, I think Connecticut's very blessed to have all of these different um, organizations not only working for you and your programs, but working together. There are several of these uh, uh, agencies that are in programs together working collaboratively, and that's, that's really important. I'll say that the pyramid model, um, going off of what Quida and others have said, it is a framework really to prevent challenging behaviors, as many of these are, and really to promote those needed skills that children have. Um, that being said, the way that um, the pyramid model really helps collaborators review and improve practices is probably the best I've seen in any other model. In fact, it's so specific around data and supports and the tools that they already have that it's very easy for a program, um, all of you to use. And so I'm just gonna talk through a few of those things. Um, our pyramid leadership teams are created with a holistic view and that's with family members teachers, administrators, social workers, um, uh, teachers and, and the like, right? That all get together and decide what are, what are things that we can improve upon, put on that reflective tool and really look at how we can collaborate, have a shared goal and work little by little to build our program. We're always looking at equity across the leadership teams and every month that they meet, they're bringing data together to really focus on those things. Um, I think also the pyramid model takes the classroom observations and the coaching and brings that together at that level where Paquita talked about prevention and, and strategies at the classroom level. The pyramid model also brings um, observation tools, the teapot and the tippy toes. The teapot is for preschool classrooms and the tippy toes for infant toddler. And what it does is it looks holistically across your classroom does an observation and then takes that data and helps to coach the teacher, a strength-based model, right? And one of the things that's really cool is that all of the pyramid model tools have data pieces with them to review, collaborate, and work with our um, leadership teams around that data so that we're constantly looking at equity and, and um, the different avenues around that, making sure that we're improving on practices and using those checklists and those data points to build um, to build quality for sure. Another huge aspect of the pyramid model is the behavior incident report process. And similar to like an ABC chart or something like that, this is an easy, simple process to track challenging behaviors in your classroom. 
And this comes with a huge tool that focuses on data and equity and also around suspension and expulsion and making sure that if there are any things that are either disproportionate or not equitable or were, uh, you know, maybe classrooms are harping um, on children in, in a way that maybe isn't um, meaning, but sort of that um, bias is kind of there, it comes up with an equity alert to, to support those teachers and classrooms and programs. And it really forces, forces that mindset of reflection and, and building those supports. So it is really fantastic to see that process throughout a program um, thrive. What I will say, and I know we're at the end, so I'll, I'll brush quickly, is that um, the Pyramid Model um, on ChallengingBehavior.org or through NCPMI has a bunch of free resources providers uh, for providers uh, in multiple languages um, for coaches, for teachers, for program administrators, and for program implementation. So challengingbehavior.org is the way to go to see all of these things and find visuals and different supports that you can use to help build up skills in your classrooms. But the pyramid model really gives that framework from the top of the pyramid leadership team all the way to the classroom and includes families at every aspect. Chris, thank you so very much. And to all of you, those who are representing Pyramid Model, ECCP, CT AIM, and Help Me Grow Sparkler, thank you for enriching this discussion all the more and having us to continue on with the discussion. And with that, we now are going to proceed to our closing message. We are going to hear words from Dr. Walter Gilliam. Now, unfortunately, Dr. Gilliam had a conflict. When we first reached out to him to be a part of this program, he had a conflict on this date. However, did not hesitate to still want to support this effort. And we are so thankful that he did put together a message that we're going to share with all of you. For those who may not know, Dr. Walter Gilliam is the Executive Director of the Buffett Early Childhood Institute at the University of Nebraska, and also the Richard D. Holland Presidential Chair in Early Childhood Development. He formerly was Associate Professor of Child Psychology and Psychology at Yale University. Dr. Gilliam has a long-standing history of speaking out about implicit bias and preschool expulsions. His words are so impactful that once what he has said has been heard, it cannot be unheard. Let us now hear words from Dr. Walter Gilliam. Hello, Connecticut. It's wonderful to be back with you. Um, as you know, I, I, I left March 1, and now I'm in Nebraska, and things are wonderful here. But it was such a delight to hear from you and that you wanted me to say a few words at this event that you're having about preschool expulsion, but actually a, an event about how to prevent preschool expulsion. As you know, um, it's a topic that's been very um, close to the work that I've been doing since, um, since the time that I was in Connecticut and really pretty much for the past 20 years. It's important, I think, for us to remember that Connecticut is the very beginnings of real serious anti-preschool expulsion efforts in the United States. And I say that because, you know, as you know, we have one of the nation's first uh, statewide um, mental health consultation programs that's designed specifically to prevent preschool expulsion and, and, and suspension. That's the uh, Early Childhood Consultation Partnership Program. That's one of the first in the nation to exist, and it's right there in Connecticut. It's also the first to have ever been rigorously evaluated in a statewide random controlled trial, right there in Connecticut. And it's the first to be federally recognized by the federal government as an evidence-based prevention program for preschool expulsion preventions as a statewide effort. And that's all right there in Connecticut. And also in 2015, Connecticut became the very first state in the nation to ban preschool expulsion and suspension. And so there's a lot to be proud of in Connecticut, but we also know that chances are very good that the work is not done yet and that there's still a lot that we need to do, especially coming out of the pandemic, to make sure that all of our children are given the opportunity they need in order to be able to succeed in school. And, and that means not having them kicked out of preschool programs. We started the work on, on 
on preschool expulsion and suspension with a report that came out back in 2005, and that was when I was there at, at Yale, and we issued it right there in Connecticut. And that report was the first national study of the rate at which children are expelled from preschool programs. And Connecticut was ranking pretty high in terms of the um, rate at which children were being kicked out of, expelled from, told not to come back to early care and education programs. In fact, nationwide, children are expelled from preschool programs based on the data we had back in 2005, uh, expelled from preschool programs at a rate more than three times that of grades K through 12 combined. And when you're looking at childcare programs, the rate's about 13 times that of grades K through 12 combined. That's a lot of really young kids getting kicked out of school before they even get to school, getting kicked out of school when they're in preschool. Um, there were some subsequent data efforts to be able to try and quantify the number of children being expelled every single year from our early care and education programs. And when you add it all up, it's about 100, this is before the pandemic, about 192,000 preschoolers expelled or suspended from early care and education programs. That's a lot of kids. You could fill up, 192,000, you could fill up every single seat at Yankee Stadium, every single seat at Met Stadium, every single seat at Giant Stadium, and you still have 13,000 expelled preschoolers standing in the parking lot without a place to sit. That's how many children we were expelling before the pandemic back in 2019, every single year from our early care and education programs. And when we were looking at who it is that's more likely to be expelled, we found that it's, um, it's you know, when you have mixed age groups, it's our four-year-olds more than the three-year-olds, so the bigger children were more likely to be expelled. We found that our black children were expelled at about twice the rate of white children, boys expelled at about four times the rate of girls, and so when you put it all together, there's really three Bs of preschool expulsion risk big, black, and boy. And the more of those that existed within an individual child, the greater the likelihood that that child's challenging behaviors would be met with the decision to expel that child, kick that child out of the program. Now note, I'm not saying that children who are bigger, children who are black, children who are boys are more likely to have challenging behaviors. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that our bigger children, our black children, our boys, really young kids, are more who have these kind of challenging behaviors or anything else that might be causing a stressor for the teacher, it's more likely for them to be kicked out as opposed to something else provided to them. That's what we were finding back in, back in 2005. U.S. Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights came in about a decade later and largely confirmed this using data that they were collecting nationwide through the public schools. If you look at like preschool expulsion and you compare it to something, I would say that one thing that you could potentially compare it to is the incarceration rate in the United States. And the reason that I would say that is because when you're talking about preschool expulsion, you're talking about kicking kids out of the society of early education. And when you're talking about adult incarceration, you're talking also about kicking people out of society, and in that case, the adult society and incarcerating them. And, putting them away in jails. We know that when you look at the rate at which children are expelled from preschool programs, about six and a half to seven and a half um, children per 1,000 enrolled in our preschool programs, that's pretty close to about the seven per 100,000 that are incarcerated in the United States. Uh, seven per 1,000 that are incarcerated in the United States. Incarceration rate, very, very similar to the preschool expulsion rate. When you look at amount of uh, racial disproportionality, um, you see that, that our African American children are expelled from preschool programs about two to three times the rate of white children. Uh, when you look at incarceration rates, black individuals incarcerated at about three times that of, of white individuals. When you look at gender disparities, uh, boys expelled at about four times, three to four times the rate of girls. Uh, men uh, incarcerated at about five times the rate of women. So in other words, I suppose that doesn't necessarily prove that there's a preschool to prison pipeline, but if there is, isn't it incredible how consistent the diameter of the pipe is? The very same children that we choose to expel from preschool programs early on in their life become the very same adults later on that we choose to incarcerate at disproportionate rates. You know, that's why it's important for us to be thinking about this in terms of you know, how do we intervene early to be able to prevent that. There's been quite a few studies that have looked at like elementary school children who have been 
expelled or suspended from elementary school and what the impact of that is. And we know that children, when they're expelled or suspended early on, they're more likely to form negative attributions and thoughts about school. They're more likely to fail a grade. They're more likely to not do well on school tests. But we also know that they're about, about um, 10 times more likely to, be, uh, to drop out of school. And we also know that they're about eight times more likely to be incarcerated when they're an adult. And there's more recent research that's shown that the children, the preschool age children of incarcerated adults are about three times more likely themselves to become kicked out of preschool. So in other words, it's, it's intergenerational as a cycle. You have a child who might be expelled from preschool and that puts that child at an increased likelihood of being uh, dropping out of school or being pushed out of school later on, which increases about eightfold the likelihood of being incarcerated. And then when they have a baby themselves, that baby now is at a threefold increased likelihood of repeating that cycle for the next generation. And it goes over and over again until we decide that we want to intervene someplace. And the best place to intervene in a cycle like that is right at the point of preschool expulsion, right when these children are young. But we also know that one of the best predictors of preschool expulsion isn't even child behavior. It's teacher stress. When teachers scored higher on measures of teacher job stress, they expelled at a significantly higher rate. And when teachers screen positive for depression, they expel at twice the rate of teachers who screen negative. So in many ways, it's not even really about the child's behavior. It's about our adult capacity to be able to manage a child's behavior. And when you have a stressed out teacher and you have one child in the classroom, then that, it becomes easy for that child to be seen as the last straw and that child then gets kicked out. You know, it's, it's important to remember that preschool expulsion is not a child behavior. It's an adult decision. And it's an adult decision that might be based in part on the behavior of the child, but also in large part on our adult capacity to be able to see what's happening, to feel like we have the ability to be able to manage that and to have active solutions. That's why it's important that Connecticut has programs like the Early Childhood Consultation Program where you have mental health specialists who can come into the early care and education classrooms and provide support to the teacher so that that teacher can make a decision other than expelling that child from the program. And I can't imagine a time that that's needed more than right now. Teachers have had it rough. Early educators have had it rough during the course of the pandemic. Uh, we did a study of early educators across the nation and found that at the beginning of the pandemic, 46% of them were screening positive for depression. I'm not saying 46% of our early educators in the nation were sad every once in a while or that they every once in a while didn't sleep too well. I'm saying 46% of our nation's early care and education providers were screening positive for depression on a scale that predicts diagnosable levels of depression. And 18 months into the pandemic, that 46% became 56%. And we already know that when teachers screen positive for depression, they're twice as likely to expel some child from the program because they're not going to have the capacity to be able to manage those challenging behaviors unless there's somebody who can come in and provide that support for those teachers. Our teachers should not be lone rangers. We should be providing them the supports that they need in order to be able to do the very best that they can. We cannot afford to underpay our early care and education providers and then when they cry out for supports, not even provide them that either. Um, the other thing that I would add is this. We also know that um, racial bias can play an awful big role in this. We did a study back in 2015, 2016 where we, um, we actually had teachers from across the nation sit down and they had headphones on and they had a screen in front of them and there was a little bar at the bottom of the screen. It was an eye tracker. And the eye tracker could measure down to a pixel on the screen and down to a thousandth of a second exactly where that teacher was looking. And the instructions said, uh, you're going to watch a video of some children playing. And this is a study to see how quickly teachers can find evidence of challenging behaviors, that the secret this is what we told them. The secret to being able to, med to intervene early and to be able to stop a behavior problem early is to be able to see when it, it might become a problem so that you can then be able to, to do something about it. And so what we want you to do is to watch this video. And any time you see a child do something that could become a behavior problem, I want you to hit this button. Now, that's the thing we told them. The parts we didn't tell them yet was this. 
none of these children are going to misbehave in these videos. And the reason that we know that is because all four of these children in the video, a black boy, a black girl, a white boy, and a white girl, all four of these children were child actors that we had hired and placed at a table and asked to play with Play-Doh. And so really we weren't interested in whether they could find behavior problems quickly. What we were interested in was this. When I led them to believe that a child might misbehave, where did their biases take their eyes? And essentially what we found was this. When we led teachers to expect that a child might misbehave, their eyes went directly to African American children, especially the black boy. And then when we later asked them who they thought they were looking at more, they thought they were looking more at boys. But their eyes didn't tell that same story. Their eyes told the story that indeed who they were really looking at the most were black children, especially the black boy. In other words, teachers thought they had a boy bias or an anti-boy bias when it comes to behavior problems. But in fact, teachers, both black teachers and white teachers and brown teachers, all teachers overall, when led to believe that a child's going to misbehave, look mostly at black children. And this much I know for a fact. If I'm expecting something like challenging behaviors to be happening over here, and that's where I'm looking, well, that's probably where I'm going to find it. And I'm not going to find it over there, because I'm not looking over there. I'm looking over here. And that's why it's important for us to realize that when it comes to children being expelled from preschool programs, it's not primarily about the behavior of the children. It's about our adult behaviors. It's about our expectations, our ability to be able to manage challenging behaviors, and also where we choose, perhaps unconsciously, to expect to find those challenging behaviors. That's the kind of work that we've been working on here um, in the context of the research that we do. Um, we started that research right there in Connecticut at Yale, but we're continuing it here with the team that we have here in Nebraska. Oh, one other thing, too, that I should tell you is this. We also found that a startling number of our early care and education providers during the course of the pandemic uh, reported being exposed to racialized aggression themselves. They were the ones targeted by racialized aggression. That during the course of the pandemic, somebody either verbally said something aggressive or physically did something aggressive to them about their race. And one of the things that we found when we looked at the relationship between that and mental health was this. Uh, race did not predict further deterioration of mental health functioning in early care and education providers. Racial identity did not predict teachers becoming more depressed or more stressed out. However, when we combined race with exposure to racialized aggression, that did predict increasing depression rates, increasing job stress rates. In other words, race did not predict increasing mental health problems but racism did. And our early care and education providers, almost all of them women, and overwhelmingly in some of our communities, women of color, are indeed exposed to racism in their daily lives. And that will impact their mental health too. And if we care about our early educators as human beings, we will take that seriously. And we will find ways to be able to support their mental health and also support them in terms of the trauma in which they receive on a daily basis oftentimes regarding race. I'm going to end by saying this, that um, social justice and civil rights are often matters of access. Access can mean access to a seat on a bus. It can mean access to voting. It can mean access to higher education. It can mean access to elementary school. And it can also mean access to our preschool and early care and education programs. But access isn't just about getting in the front door. It's about also making sure you're not shoved out the back door, too, in the form of preschool expulsion and suspension. And that's why I care deeply about this. There are many of our children who historically, for 450 years, have been denied access to education. And we cannot, in good conscience, create early care and education programs that continue to disenfranchise children from access to education, in this case, in the form of access to early education. So I applaud the things that are happening in Connecticut. I'm just thrilled that I was there for a big part of the things that were happening in Connecticut. And I charge you to keep going forward. I'm going to end with a, with a real quick story. Um, Back in maybe 2015, 2016, 
I was um, getting ready to stop off at a deli um, in Bethany. I lived in Bethany at the time, not too far from New Haven. And I was getting ready to fly to Washington to testify for the House Appropriations Committee regarding issues having to do with early care and education. And stopped off at the deli to get a cup of coffee. And I saw a man there named Richard Doolittle. He was probably in his 80s at the time. And he was the town uh, peach tree farmer. He grew peach trees. And um, when he grew his peach trees, you know, everybody knew that he grew the best peach trees in town, and he was the, the expert on, on anything having to do with gardening, and so the whole town referred to him as Dr. Doolittle, because I guess if you're in a small town and you're the expert on something, your last name is Doolittle, everybody's going to call you Dr. Doolittle, I guess. And so I come up to him and I said, Dr. Doolittle, I, and I didn't tell him where I was going, but I said, Doc, I'm, I'm curious, if I were to take the life of a peach tree and break it down into three phases, the first one is when I put the seed into the ground and then it sprouts. And the second phase is when the sprout turns into a tree. And the third phase is when the tree starts to produce fruit. And I want to have really good peaches. And say, for instance, I could make one of those phases perfect. Perfect rain, perfect sun, perfect everything. For one of those. The other two, I don't know what I'm going to get, but one of those I can make perfect, and I want to get good peaches. Which phase should I pick to make perfect? And he didn't waste any time at all. He said, well, I'd pick the first one. And I said, well, why? And he said, because whatever you do to that little seed will set the potential for everything that tree can become. And that stuck with me. I actually took it with me when I was going to Congress, because I thought, well, if these appropriators in Congress aren't going to listen to my science. Maybe they'll at least listen to the wisdom of a peach tree farmer from Connecticut. You know, and so with that story, I want to thank you for all that you're doing to not only get kids in early care and education programs, but to make sure that they're having good experiences there and that they're not pushed out the back door. And that our early care and education providers can have the supports they need to make the decisions they want to make. I've never met an early care and education provider who went into the field of early care and education because they wanted to kick kids out of school. You know, so thank you, thank you, thank you for all that you do. Bye. Well, powerful words. I certainly hope that it entered into your mind and your thoughts and your soul uh, for me as it did for you, or hope it did for you as it did for me. Thank you so much, Dr. Gilliam. And thank all of you, our panelists. Thank you so much again, CTA, ECCP, Help Me Grow Pyramid, uh, Help Me Grow Sparkler and Pyramid Model. Thank you so much, Mel Vett. Thank you for the wonderful opening keynote address. Michelle Levy, thank you so much for all of your leadership in this effort supporting uh, exclusionary practices, trying to mitigate them, that is. Of course, we certainly thank our SDE partners. Thank you so much, Kim Traverso, for your welcome. And Commissioner Beth Bai, thank you for your leadership and your guidance supporting all of the Office of Early Childhood, which is not just focused on the children birth to five. We are invested in children throughout their developmental process. And most importantly, those of you who are still here viewing, we know we went a little bit beyond our time, but thank you so much for your patience and your participation, because we are here because of you. We must do this together. As it has been said before, it takes a village, and you are a part of that village. So thank you so very much. This is the beginning of more things to come with behavioral health initiatives. Please continue to be on the lookout with what comes out from the Office of Early Childhood. You can look at our website, ctoec.org, to learn more. With that, we'll say pause for now and look forward to coming before you again as a collective body. Take care, all. Mm -hmm.